Okay, so today we're going to be going over the um, calculus review guide. This should be good for the standard level and the higher level class. It's a good review. There are seven questions, so let's get started, shall we? So the following diagram shows part of the graph, f of x, where uh, x is real numbers. The shaded region is bounded by the x-axis and the y-axis of this cool graph. Write down an integral for the area of the region. Okay. So the integral for this would just be anything that's from, all right, so it's the integral from zero, because that's the lower bound here, up to some x value. So the first thing we need to do is find out, well, when does this curve cross the x-axis? That happens when you set, well, that only happens when y equals zero, so you set this whole thing equal to zero. Just by looking at this, it only equals zero when either x equals negative four, so that means this part equals zero, or it looks like x equals 2. So look, since this is the positive one, we're looking at a value where x equals 2. So the final answer should be this, the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x with respect to x. OK, find the area of region R. This is actually real easy because all you do is use a calculator. OK? You don't need to, you, you can do it by hand, but there's really no need. Um, the answer should be 28. Uh, what's next? <clears throat> All right, tricky question. The three points, uh, origin, 310, and A0, uh, define the vertices of a triangle. Find the value of A. Um, and we know that the area of this triangle is equal to the area of region R. So we know the area of this triangle is equal to 28. Well, looking at it, uh, 28 is going to equal, okay, so what's the formula for the area of a triangle? One-half base times height. Well, the height would be the y value of b, so the height is going to be 10. And the base is going to be the distance from a to c, which is the x-coordinate of c, so a. So that seems fair. So we'll do one-half base times height equals 28. Very cool. So a little bit of algebra, and you find that A equals 28 over 5. Okay, and that's that. No big deal. Um, okay, so the graph, Y equals negative X cubed, is transformed onto this by a translation of A units vertically and a stretch parallel to the X-axis of scale factor B. So it's a horizontal stretch of a factor of B. Write down the value of A. Well, this is vertically translated by 33 because it goes up 33 units, okay? Well, so that's, that's obvious because it's, it's not touching any x value. Um, and this is exactly how you would vertically translate it. You would just add units to whatever the, the basic thing is. Um, so that's not a big deal. So the first answer should be 33. Now the second answer is a little bit trickier, okay? So we look at what's the horizontal stretch factor. Well, this is a little trickier, but it's really not a big deal. So um, ignoring the vertical translation, we'll just look at this thing. Um, and we can also ignore the uh, negative, I think. That's not, that's not as important. Um, we're really looking at y equals x cubed. Really, the best way to do this is to, you know, let's just set y equal to 1. You know, let's set y equal to 1 and solve for x. So that means every one unit up, how many units um, to the right or the left am I going to go? That's how you think of horizontal stretch. So when you do that, all right, we, we set y equal to 1 and we solve for x. Well, when you do that, um, well, it's going to be, well, it's going to be 1 equals, let's get up here. Where am I right here? Yeah, let's put that in there. So if I set y equal to 1, we're going to get 0.08x cubed. I mean, we can kind of ignore the negative. You know? We can kind of ignore the negative uh, 0.08. And we can ignore the positive 33, because neither of those really affect horizontal stretch. So when we're looking at this, we solve by dividing by 0.08 and taking the cube root. And that means you got a horizontal stretch factor of about 2.32. Okay, let's go. The outer dome of a large cathedral 
has the shape of a hemisphere of diameter 32, supported by vertical walls of height 17. Okay, so that's this outer part here. This, this top one is like um, half of a sphere, and then you got vertical walls that are 17 meters high, and they tell you it's 17 meters high. It is supported by an inner dome, which can be modeled by rotating this curve, which is the one we just found, 360 degrees about the y-axis between y equals 0 and y equals 33. All right. Find the volume of the space between the two domes. Well, um, we're looking for the shaded region right here. So we got to think, okay, let, let's be a little creative about this, you know. Um, looking at this. Let's think. So we have two volumes that we need. The outer shell is just a hemisphere. All right, you got to think 3D here. So that's half of a sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. r is 16 in this case. Okay. Uh, we also need the cylinder. So that's pi r squared h. Well, again, it, r is 16, but the height of the cylinder is 17. So we add these two volumes together, and we got the big thing. But we have to subtract out the volume of this particular curve. We got to subtract out this thing. Well, they leave it up to you how you want to do it, but I prefer when we're rotating around the y-axis. We, I, I prefer the washer method. And the washer method is you want to think um, I'm making washers here. So I have to make my little rectangle, which is dx times f of x. And I rotate it 2 pi r around the uh, y-axis. So 2 pi x, uh, f of x dx. f of x dx is like my rectangle. And when you do all this, you get a final answer of 1803.93. There you go. All right, next. The, the Happy Straw Company manufactures drinking straws. The straws are packaged in small, closed, rectangular boxes, each with length 8, width 4, height 3. The information is shown in this cool diagram. Calculate the surface area of the box. I mean, this is actually super easy because all you got to do is uh, find the area of the front and double it. So the area of the front would be 8 times 3, that's 24, and you double it. 4 times 8, which is 32, you double it for the top and the bottom, and the right and the left side, which is 3 times 4, which is 12, and you double it. And the surface area will be 136. Not a problem. Next, you got to calculate the length of AG. So the, di the distance from A all the way to G, this is the distance formula which is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. You end up with 9.43. All right. Uh, let's see. Each week, the Happy Straw Company sells x boxes of straws. We know that the derivative is equal to negative 2x plus 220, where p is the weekly profit. Um, find the number of boxes that should be sold each week to maximize profit. Well, this is hearkening back to... Um, Kind of an old concept in calculus where, you know, what happens when I, when I want to maximize something? That the only time that you can maximize or minimize anything, which is also called optimizing, is when you set the derivative equal to zero. So when you set this thing equal to zero, you find that x equals 110. Um, at the college level, you'd be required to verify that this is a maximum. Um, but at the high school level, we're gonna let you we're gonna let you have a pass on that. The uh, at the college level, you do the derivative one more time, and ask if the derivative is negative or positive. In this case, the derivative of the derivative is negative, which means I'm kind of curving downward. And it's gonna make a maximum. <clears throat> um, it is known that selling 20 boxes gives a profit of 1,700. Find the value of profit. Well, how do I undo the derivative? I got to take the integral. So I integrate, and uh, this involves the power rule. The power rule is when you add 1 to the exponent, and whatever the exponent is, you put it in the denominator. So here, this x to the 1 becomes x to the 2. 
the two goes down into the denominator and cancels out with this two, and that's that one. This 220, you stick an X on it, and then you have a plus C. Now, how do I figure out the plus C? Well, they give me a point. They say 20 boxes gives me a profit of $1,700. So everywhere I see a, an X, I'm going to put 20. Everywhere I see a Y, I'm going to put a 1,700. When you solve, C is going to equal negative 2,300. No big deal. Find the least number of boxes which must be sold each week in order to make a profit. Well, this is kind of a tricky question, but I want to know when um, when does my prop when, when am I going to break even? Okay, at what point am I going to break even? Well, that happens when my profit equals zero. Okay, so I set this thing equal to zero and I solve a little bit of GDC would be fine, and you find that X is about equal to eleven point oh oh five. So when I calculate, you know, my break even point. Um, the first time that I actually get a positive profit um, would have to be the first number of boxes after 11.005, which means it should be 12. 12 is the first time that I make a profit. If I only sold 11, technically I'm still losing, right? Because it's under 11.005 technically. I have to get up to 12 in order to start making a profit, all right? All right, uh, consider this curve, y equals x squared minus 4x plus 2, find the derivative. This is the power rule. So with this one, the 2 comes down out front and you get 2x. This is minus 4x, you drop this x and you get just 2x minus 4 and this plus 2 goes away. So the final answer should be 2x minus 4. 2x minus 4. What is the normal to the curve at x equals 1? Write your answer in standard form. All right, this is the standard form thing is only there because Edge Elastic only accepts equations in certain formats. On the IB exam, they might be a little bit more lenient. The point is, how do you find the normal to the curve? Okay, well, um, looking at this equation, the first thing we need to do is we need the uh, slope of the tangent line, which is the derivative, okay? So the slope of the tangent line is well, you take 2x minus 4 and you got to plug in 1 because it's the normal curve at 1. So that means that the slope of the tangent line is negative 2. Uh, to get the slope of the normal line, which is perpendicular to the tangent line, you have to change the sign and flip it upside down. So negative 2 becomes positive 1 over 2. Okay, so we got our slope, happy. Now we need a point on the line. Um, I already have x equals 1, but I need the y value that goes with it. So before I go any further with the, you know, the, the equation of a line, let's figure out the point. So we want to plug 1 into the original equation. All right, so I plug 1 into the original equation, and we finally get a y value equal to negative 1. Nice. So I have my point. It's 1, negative 1. Um, now I want to figure out what b is. You know, my, I got my regular equation, which is y equals mx plus b for a line. I plug in my slope, which is positive 1 over 2, and I want to plug in my point. Uh, y becomes negative 1, and x becomes positive 1, and I want to solve for b doing algebra. A little bit of algebra, you find out b equals negative 3 over 2, and uh, that's it. So the final answer should be y equals 1 over 2x minus 3 over 2. And that's it. Um, Edge Elastic wants you to put it in standard form, so you'd have to like move this over to the left and clean it up a little bit. Whatever, whatever, whatever. No big deal. Okay. All right. Cool. Next. Um, all right. So the production of oil in barrels per day from an oil field satisfies this differential equation, where T is measured in days from the start of production. Very cool. What's this? This, you just use a calculator, you plug it in, and then you're good. Your answer should be 1252.76. All right. <clears throat> the production of oil at the start is 20,000 barrels of oil per day. Find an expression for production in terms of T. And they want, uh, we want it as an exact answer with natural log and all that other stuff. So let's try to integrate this thing now, okay? Well, um, we got something with a crazy exponent. This is 2 plus t to the negative 1 power. So I really want to let u equal this. 
So when I let u equal this, a little bit of derivative and substitutions, the, you take the derivative of both sides, and you find out that du equals dt. Okay, so this is pretty easy. The 1,000 can come out to the front. 2 plus t becomes u, and dt becomes du. The integral of 1 over u is just the natural log of u. You can plug 2 plus t back in, and uh, we're good. But we need to figure out what the c is, right? Well, to figure out what c is, we got to plug in a point. Everywhere we see a t, uh, a t we want to plug in 0, and everywhere we see a y, we want to plug in 20,000. So we plug in 0 right here, and plug in 20,000 right here. A um, little bit of decimal approximation, but c equals 19306.9. Okay. All right. No big deal. Um, determine 0 to 365 and state what it means. Well, um, you integrate this with respect to t. You can use a calculator for that. It's really not a big deal. And uh, what does it mean for the integral from 0 to 365? Well, actually, this is actually super easy. It's how much have you produced in a year? Because it every, you know, every t here is in barrels per day. T is measured in days. So if you got 365 days, that's a year. So how much oil did I produce in a year? About 8.8 um, .8 million barrels per year. That's what that means. <clears throat> Almost done. Um, right, a box of chocolates is to have a ribbon tied around it, as is shown in this diagram. The box is in the shape of a cuboid with a height of three a length, um, length is x and width is y. After going around the box, an extra 10 centimeters of ribbon is needed to form the bow. Okay, find an expression for the total length of ribbon uh, in terms of x and y. Okay, well, uh, this is really not a big deal. Um, let's think about it, right? So this top long ribbon here is just... Um, x, but I have it on the bottom too, so you get 2x. Same thing here, I got uh, y here, and I've got y here, so that's 2y. Now I gotta think about how tall this box is. Well, it's three centimeters high, and how many times do I get the height? Well, one, two, three, four. So it's four times three. But I have another 10 centimeters of ribbon for the bow, so I gotta add 10. A little bit of work here, four times three is 12, plus 10 is 22, and we're done. Okay. Um, the volume of the box is 450 cubic centimeters. Write down y in terms of x. Well, the volume of a rectangular prism like this is length times width times height. So you get volume equals length times width times height. Substitute stuff in, the height is three, Length is x, blah, blah, blah. And let's solve for y. That's what it's asking for. So we divide both sides by 3x, a little simplifying, and you get y equals 150 over x. Okay, that's b. What's the derivative of the total length of ribbon? Okay, well, um, with respect to x. So first of all, let's substitute our new y value in. y is equal to 150 over x. So let's plug that in right there. And um, clean it up, make it look good, you know, put it in a calculus-friendly format. So we got to bring this x to the top, make it a negative. 2 times 150 is 300, and you're good. So now we want to take the derivative. Well, the derivative of 2x is just 2. The derivative of um, x to the negative 1, you bring the negative 1 down out front. That's why you get a negative there. And you subtract 1 from the exponent, and you get negative 2. When you take the derivative of just 22, that just goes away. Uh, probably want to rewrite this in a nice, nice format so the x to the negative 2 power can go into the denominator, and you're done. Presto change it. I'm pretty sure on the IB exam, if you left it like this, you're not going to get points taken off because technically this is correct. But if you want to be stylistically correct, you want to do it this way because we don't really like having negatives in the exponent. <clears throat> Solve. What happens when the derivative equals 0? No problem. We can set this thing equal to zero, and you can use a calculator or whatever you want. But you get 12.2474. All 
All right, you can multiply both sides by x squared, add 300 to the right, divide by two, and then take the square root of 150, and you get this. Uh, very cool. Hence or otherwise, find the minimum length of ribbon required. Well, since this is the derivative equals zero, we know that this is gonna be a maximum or a minimum, and we're pretty sure it's a minimum. So you really wanna just take this x value and plug it back into um, my ribbon length formula. So I could take this, plug it into x, plug that into x, and you get 70.9898, basically. And that's how you find the minimum length of ribbon required. Last question. Uh, a ball, this is probably the hard one. A ball is attached to the end of a string and it's spun horizontally. Its position relative to a given point is given by this equation. You might already feel your eyes glazing over. It's not that bad, I promise. Show that the ball is moving in a circle by writing down the radius of the circle. You want to use the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Okay. Well, this ball only moves in a circle if the distance from the origin remains the same no matter what t is, because that's the radius. We want to use the distance formula. Well, the, um, the distance is, you know, the square root of x squared plus y squared. So I can factor out a 1.5, because 1.5 squared factors out, and the square root of 1.5 squared is 1.5. And you're left with sine squared plus cosine squared of whatever. They're the same thing. That whole thing equals 1. It really doesn't matter what's inside, as long as these two guys are the same. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So you get 1.5. So yeah, it is a circle because the radius stays the same. I'm always 1.5 away from the origin. Find an expression for the velocity. Okay, well, uh, all you got to do is take the derivative of my displacement vector, which is, um, you know, this thing. Got to take the, the derivative. All right, well, the derivative of 1.5 cosine whatever, I got to do the chain rule. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine of 0.1t squared. Then I got to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of 0.1t squared, the 2 comes down out front, and you get 0 0.2. 0 0.2 times 1.5 becomes 0 0.3 uh, t. Because, uh, you know, the 2 comes down, but the t is still there. So you have to multiply by t. And that's the top one. The derivative of this one is similar. Uh, the derivative of sine is just cosine. Then you got to multiply by the derivative of the inside. And it's the exact same reasoning. And you get this thing. Very cool. Um, hence, show that the velocity of the ball is always perpendicular to the position vector of the ball. All right, no big deal. Um, if this is my position vector right here, r, and this is my velocity vector, which I just copied down here, um, the only way that they're perpendicular, two vectors are perpendicular if and only if their dot product is zero. It's a definition of being perpendicular. Their dot product has to equal zero. Okay, well, uh, the dot product of these two bad boys um, is pretty easy. The dot product means you just add the following two things. You gotta multiply that times that, and you have to multiply that times that, and then you add them together, okay? Uh, but on close inspection, you can see 1.5 cosine times negative sine, 1.5 sine times, you know, 0 0.3 cosine, you're going to get the same thing, but one of them's a negative and one of them's a positive. So they cancel out. This whole thing cancels out and becomes a zero, right? You can see sine, cosine, sine, cosine. Everything cancels out. So yes, these two guys are always going to be perpendicular no matter what. All right? <clears throat> no problem. Find an expression for the acceleration of the ball. Well, the acceleration of the ball is the derivative of the velocity. Acceleration is always the derivative of velocity. So, okay, um, I just copy down my velocity vector. I'll take the derivative again. This is the product rule. Okay, this is the product rule. So the derivative of t <coughs> is just 1. So that's why you get this thing. Then you got to take the derivative of sine again. So the derivative of sine is cosine. And then the derivative of the inside is uh, 0.2t. So you got to multiply uh, 0.3t times 0.2t. So you get 0.06t squared. 
Similar argument to the bottom one here. You're going to do the product rule again. So that's the acceleration. Um, very cool. So the string breaks when the magnitude of the acceleration exceeds 20 uh, meters per second squared. What's the value of t? So basically, what time does the string break? Well, that only happens when the magnitude of the acceleration, which is the distance formula, equals 20. So I want to say, OK, what's the magnitude of this right-hand side equaling 20? Well, that's the square root of x squared plus y squared. And I would use a calculator for this part. You know, no need to worry. You can just type it in a calculator. And that would be y1, this right-hand side. y2 could be equal to 20. And then you could solve. And you'll find that t equals 18.256 right about. OK. And then the last one. How many complete revolutions has the ball completed from t equals 0 to the instant at which the string breaks? OK. So this is a tricky question. We need to reframe it. All right. They're basically asking, what is the final angle of the ball in radians? Radians is how far around have I gone? So I basically want to know how far around have they gone um, as an angle, OK, at 18.256. Well, uh, here's the displacement vector. This just shows you your position, more or less. And um, I noticed that there really only one thing really matters when it comes to how many revolutions we've done, and it's this middle one right here, OK? As soon as this middle one equals 2 pi, we've done a full revolution, right? It doesn't matter if this is t cubed, t to the fourth, whatever. If this middle thing equals 2 pi, we have done one revolution. OK, well, um, if I just plug in my time, 18.256, which is when the ball breaks, I plug it into this middle thing, I'm going to get 33.329 radians. Now, how many revolutions is that? Well, one revolution is 2 pi. So I'm going to divide by 2 pi, and you get 5.3 uh, revolutions, which means that the ball completes 5 revolutions. And that's the answer. The answer is 5 revolutions. Uh, don't type in 5.3. It's 5. And that's it. Okay, if you have any questions, please uh, shoot me an email or talk to me. Thank you. Bye-bye.